Well, hello everyone, and um, we are full force into high renaissance at the moment. Leonardo, with his uh, incredibly inquiring mind, push, pushed it forward, and we now come to Raphael. Well, he was about uh, 30 years younger than Leonardo, and uh, about eight years younger than Michelangelo. But he didn't live as long as Michelangelo did. Um, Michelangelo lived almost until he was 90, and Raphael only until he was 37. But it was very much a blessed life. And um, therefore, he stands somewhere between Leonardo and Michelangelo. And um, one of the reasons is because he did not, he did not feel a need to explore as Leonardo did. He, uh, his mind was that of uh, absorbing. He, uh, he was brilliant at absorbing. He also didn't have a tortured mind as uh, Michelangelo will have. He, uh, he had a quiet mind, he, uh, a happy mind. He was very handsome, he was um, very intelligent, tactful, uh, he, um, he was very industrious and as a, as a result he became a perfect courtier. He was friend of uh, popes and princess. Everything came easily to him and our favorite word spread satura described Raphael. He made even the hardest task look as if it was effortless. And in his um, many paintings, he will combine, well, uh, sentimentality usually is very pleasing in the moment, but doesn't stand the uh, test of time. However, what he did manage to do was combine sentimentality and monumentality. And that made a recipe that was irresistible for, uh, for the painters to come and for the centuries to come. He was born in the town of Urbino and um, there he was originally trained by his father who also was a painter, mediocre painter but good enough to teach. And then he came under the guidance of Perugino. And, uh, we saw Perugino earlier with the fresco of the Christ giving the keys to St. Peter. And uh, so absorbing was Raphael's mind that he, in fact, managed to, managed to uh, adopt the ways of his teacher in such a way that a number of paintings, in fact, are uh, difficult to tell which one did it. In this case, for instance, Raphael does uh, the marriage of the Virgin. He essentially takes Perugino's uh, central portion of uh, the Christ giving the keys to St. Peter and adopts it to his own uh, usage. Marriage of the Virgin, she is betrothed to, uh, to Joseph and uh, the uh, the custom was uh, that uh, all young men who wished to buy for the hand of, uh, of the Virgin had to bring their rods with them, walking rods, walking canes, what have you. And, uh, and the rod that um, belonged to the Chosen One was supposed to bloom. And it just so happened that uh, Joseph's rod had bloomed and here you have the case and thus the betrothal is taking place and one of the suitors who is very disgruntled over the fact is bringing his rod over his knee. So that is the story, but just as with Perugino, it takes place in the front just before us. Uh, secondary scenes take place in middle ground and there is a temple uh, in the background. In this case, Raphael opened up the doors so that all the orthogonals are definitely coming together at a vanishing point inside the doorway. The, um, he changed the shape of uh, the temple. He, as I said, concentrated all the action in the middle 
and had also given the shape to uh, this uh, easel piece, the shape of uh, the cupola on the temple uh, to correlate the two. Well, this of course was a fresco. So as you see, he was very, very capable of absorbing the lessons of others. He will do the same uh, when he came to Florence and uh, he did possess of extraordinary talent and became uh, and became the dear of everyone. Uh, also, it was easy to commission him, whereas of course neither Leonardo nor Michelangelo were available. Uh, Raphael, as ever, was eager to please. And here he paints the portrait of one of uh, the wives of very wealthy men of Florence. And what he does, he essentially takes uh, Leonardo's composition and adopts it to, uh, to Maddalena Doni. Uh, but of course, Maddalena Doni was no Mona Lisa, and it was important for her to have all her jewelry or the most uh, extraordinary jewelry, adorn her person. And there we see this jewelry both on her hands, on her neck. She is dressed in spectacular clothes. And thus you can appreciate the Mona Lisa all the better. He, uh, he will do a number of these Madonnas. Uh, and very often he will use Florentine girls to model for them. This is the Cooper Madonna, which is at Harvard. And this is the case where you see how sentimentality, in fact, is combined with monumentality. All of that, additionally, is combined to, to a virtuoso technique, and this produces Raphael. Raphael, who will be far more important, in fact, for future renaissances, to, so to speak, any time in your classical tendency occurs in the history of art, one looks at Raphael. However compromised Raphael, he will become in the hands of lesser artists. But he had this astonishing ability to combine sweetness and, as I said, uh, monumentality with tremendous skill and produce something like this as we see it, uh, a beautiful mother with a beautiful child in front of a spectacular landscape, everything done with consummate skill. Uh, in this case, he must have uh, looking, of course, at, uh, at our Fra Filippo Lippi, but he had uh, cut down all the incident, and, uh, and in fact, uh, he, was, uh, he was able to to reduce uh, the Filippo art to the important aspects. The important aspects of uh, weightiness and uh, solemnity and uh, also a great power of organization. So out goes the, uh, this, the, uh, the chair. Uh, the landscape is not nearly as busy. Uh, the, the pa his powers of organization turn the whole thing, of course, into a, tri a triangle and make Madonna and Child dominate uh, not only landscape, but dominate the world. She is no longer a pretty Florentine girl with, uh, uh, with three urchins uh, sitting in, in her pretty room on her pretty chair. She is now a force to reckon with. Still another, and uh, here we have a perfect triangle, Madonna of the Meadow, he added uh, John the Baptist here, and again, a perfect organization. And then he gets uh, summoned to Rome, the, and because in Rome, uh, the Pope now is Julius II, and he now has Michelangelo paint the Sistine ceiling, but he wants someone else to paint his private apartments. And um, his architect is one Bramante, who was uh, a great architect of the Renaissance. And Bramante happens to be from Urbino as well. So Bramante recommends uh, Raphael to the Pope, and Raphael thus is um, summoned to Rome. 
to decorate the so-called uh, stanze or the rooms, the private rooms of the Pope. That's, this is where the Pope uh, signs his documents, this is where the Pope has his documents, this is where the Pope's private library is, these are private quarters of the Pope. Important. Not as important as the Sistine Chapel, of course, because everybody comes to the Sistine Chapel, whereas only the Pope and his uh, Privy Council, essentially, come to his apartments. Nevertheless, important enough. And what the Pope wants of Raphael is decorate uh, his uh, room of the signatures with, um, with allegories of uh, theology, philosophy, the arts, and the law, and uh, which Raphael will do. And the most uh, important and uh, remarkable of them all is the wall with the, uh, this is theology, that's not the one, it is the room with um, philosophy. This, the adjacent uh, side is, um, we see the arts here, but we will be going to philosophy. Stanza della Signatura, sound and south and western walls. And thus, here we have it. Now, this was quite an extraordinary task because uh, he uh, took upon himself to paint something like 50 figures, which ultimately will become the personifications of both creative arts and, um, and also creative thought. What he does here, his composition is remarkable. What he does, he takes Bramante's architecture, and this is what we see here, and in front of that architecture, he arranges in a semicircle, as I said, almost uh, something like 50 various figures. Uh, now, at this time, there was a feeling that, uh, that Plato's poetic propositions were in fact, in some way, equal to uh, Aristotle rational propositions and that was the task that Raphael had to reconcile and thus we see he, he does he does many of his paintings in sort of figure eight um, composition and thus we have sort of a circle here right there that is formed by the architecture and another uh, they made up of philosophers and that circle is recessed. And uh, the great uh, sculptures of Apollo and Minerva stand on each side. Apollo represent, uh, representing the, um, the creative spirit and Minerva representing the rational spirit. And then, uh, so thus the whole thing is sort of split in the middle. And here is Plato with his poetic propositions towards Apollo and Aristotle with his rational propositions towards Minerva. And then all the philosophers gather around them accordingly. This is, uh, this is just an approximate uh, scheme of how the idea works. Um, here's uh, the Apollo is here and Athena there. Apollo represents, well, logic, yes, but Athena, or rather Minerva, does that too. However, there's also on the side of Plato, as I said, um, there's a great deal of uh, Platonic thought, whereas Aristotelian thought is on the right, and that has to do more with action uh, rather than deduction goddess Athena, and yes, Athena or Minerva. Uh, thus we have rhetoric here, history. History is represented by Thucydides, rhetoric by Aeschylus, Pythagoras, is, Pythagoras Heraclitus, and Euclid represent mathematics. Uh, here is um, the, the, all the philosophers with their names marked here, and when you have your PowerPoint you'll be able to see it. Uh, it, except with, the, with Plato and Aristotle, perhaps Socrates, Pythagoras, uh, Euclid, uh, the rest of them, we don't know precisely that they are who we think they are, but for the lack of um, better propositions, they stay. 
uh, Raphael will paint himself into the painting right there, but an even prominent, more prominent place he will give to another artist, to Michelangelo. He did see the ceiling that Michelangelo was painting at the time. He was deeply impressed by that ceiling, and it seems that his, uh, the greatest sign of admiration that, uh, that he could give was to place Michelangelo right here as Heraclitus, as one of the mathematicians, as one of the scientists to place him by himself uh, almost in the middle of, uh, of the painting. He sits there in the garb of contemporaneous sculptor, wears everybody else, wears ancient costumes and they either discuss things between each other or they are paired in uh, various uh, other ways. Here's Socrates who of course always talked and there he is talking to a group of youth including um, Alexander the Great. Now, this, of course, is anachronistic because Alexander and Socrates lived at a different time, but that doesn't bother Raphael. Uh, we see Zeno, who is the founder of Stoicism, then Pythagoras, uh, uh, Anaxagoras, Hypatia, presumably is this person right here, Epicurus, and as I said, uh, Michelangelo represents Heraclitus. Diogenes in the middle is um, the founder of cynicism. Cynicism which is um, disregard for all human conventions. As, as a result, he uh, paints him here practically undressed, sitting in the middle of the, of the steps. Bramante, as I said, was an architect of St. Peter, a good friend of Raphael, and he paints Bramante here as Euclid. He also uh, includes Ptolemy right there, and Zoroaster with a celestial globe, Plotinus, and there he is himself, Raphael. Uh, it all, as I said, takes place in front of this tremendous, uh, remarkable Bramante architecture, and Bramante is, at this point, is building St. Peter's. Uh, and this, as I said, the school, the school of Athens, the name was given later. Uh, at this point, it was just uh, the uh, allegory of philosophy through the ages as um, uh, Raphael uh, painted them. And um, it is a majestic drama of human thought that uh, marches through history. And... Uh, Raphael is still quite young at the time, and to be able to do this sort of an arrangement and to convey it with such weightiness and majesty was, um, was an extraordinary achievement. In fact, uh, Michelangelo will finish his ceiling in um, 1512, and Raphael, I think, a couple of years later, he will finish the stanzas, and Rome will be divided between uh, the pro-Raphael and pro-Michelangelo factions. Um, here is Euclid, who is Bramante, as you see here, and, uh, and here is Ptolemy, who, uh, who had posited the, uh, the theory of um, geocentrism, and, uh, and which, which will exist until the time of Copernicus. And uh, here we see him holding the, uh, the earth in his hands as the center of the universe. Uh, the, um, there he, uh, here we have Pythagoras, and uh, this is, and as you see, all these people are dressed in classical garb, except for Michelangelo himself, who is sitting there all by himself, dressed in contemporaneous garb. And uh, Michelangelo was clearly an afterthought because a cartoon of uh, of the wall exists. It lives in Milan, and in this cartoon, one can see everybody except for Michelangelo. Raphael left the space open to give it to give the weight and more weightiness to everybody around it. But then he placed Michelangelo in later. He also he became so incredibly popular and uh, and so incredibly successful, and uh, he served both popes Julius II and then. 
Leo X, who was um, a Medici Pope, uh, including everybody else who was uh, who was wealthy, and um, and he uh, he decorated a villa, a villa that was built by one Agostino Gigi, uh, who was a personal banker to the Pope. Uh, he created this palace of love that he asked Raphael to decorate. Raphael certainly did all the designs for the decoration, even though most of the decoration was then done by assistants. One fresco that was definitely done by Raphael is that of Galatea, the nymph with whom Cyclos Polythemus fell in love. And on the adjacent here, adjacent fresco, we see Polythemus painted not by Raphael. But, the, uh, but Galatea is painted by Raphael. Here she is. She is running away from Polythemus. He, she is uh, in a shell, similarly to Sandro Botticelli, but very dissimilarly in execution. Uh, Raphael gives her all the bodily weight of a beautiful woman that Botticelli deprived his birth of Venus or his Venus, who became, became unsubstantial, just as, well, love is unsubstantial. And uh, here is Galatea, she has weight, she has body, she is presented in this uh, very complex uh, twisting position that Raphael loved very much. We, may, we can see it right here, too. It's kind of the same uh, twisting pose. And he repeats the pose here, uh, the uh, dolphins uh, drawing her shells. She is surrounded by nereids and uh, and tritons. And here again is our figure eight. Uh, the angels up above form the upper circle, and uh, the figures down below form the lower circle. It is possible that likely really that uh, an assistant did the water because if you look at the water it almost appears uh, to be like ice whereas Raphael uh, painted better than that. He also was uh, a remarkable portraitist and um, in this case he uh, he painted the portrait of his good friend uh, Baltasare Castiglioni, the author of the book Il Corteggiano. Uh, the Book of the Courtier, which became uh, a bestseller and uh, became um, a book of rules how to behave properly and, uh, and the proper behavior for, uh, for Castiglioni. Uh, a courtier, a true courtier, was never a sycophant. That was just not, that then he is not a gentleman. Good manners did not equal hypocrisy, and uh, respectable behavior did not equal prudery. Because once hypocrisy and prudery and sycophancy comes in, then you're not a true gentleman, then, uh, and uh, you're not a true courtier. Uh, at the center of the book is respect for others, and it's respect of others, a deep, sincere respect for others that determines good manners. And it is still, uh, the book is still very much in print and, um, and could be read. Here, Raphael, uh, in a way, again borrows uh, Leonardo's uh, Mona Lisa, uh, but, uh, but borrows Mona Lisa in its depth, not only in its composition. Uh, Baltazari Castiglioni is dressed in very dark, wealthy, rich, but dark, and unadorned clothes, and, uh, and his, his true decoration are his eyes, his bright, intelligent, penetrating eyes. And, uh, and this very much corresponds to Mona Lisa and the intelligence of her face. He also painted the, uh, the portrait of Julius II, when Julius II was older, and it, again, is a penetrating portrait because this is the Pope who was more of a, a general than he was a Pope. He spent most of his time in saddle fighting than he did in, um, in the Vatican trying to, to bring his consistory together. 
and but now he is older he has uh, quieted down he perhaps has resolved his uh, imperious soul and that is how Raphael is painting him um, looking down looking into himself also absorbed in his thoughts he also will paint uh, Leo X, who will succeed uh, Julius II. This man here, I think, in his late 30s, believe it or not, but uh, he, uh, he was an unredeemable voluptuary. He also was a Medici, and therefore he loved art, he loved learning, he loved philosophy, and when he became Pope, what is known of him was, uh, was a saying, well, God granted us papacy, let us enjoy it, and he certainly did that. He assembled around himself uh, a court of artists and, and scholars and uh, philosophers and writers. It was indeed a brilliant court. And uh, he was also, uh, he also loved his family. And the word nepotism comes from papal desire of a number of popes. To enrich their families and sometimes uh, the families consisted of uh, nephews, nepots, sometimes those nephews were children of the popes but here is Leo X uh, and he's shown here with his two cousins in this case. Uh, Julio who will become Clement VII, the next pope, and still another cousin. So this is the Medici family that of course surrounds the pope uh, he sits uh, in the Vatican in front of uh, a table and uh, just and to show what a scholar he was. There is a brilliant uh, manuscript uh, that's in front of him. He has a magnifying glass in his hand and a bell to summon help. So well everything is painted. This manuscript is recognized and it is in the collection of the Vatican. Right here. And now we uh, go to, uh, to the man that uh, Raphael honored in uh, his school of Athens to Michelangelo himself. A true giant, a true titan, which is why we will look at him, we will look at his early career in this lecture and his later career in, uh, in the next lecture because uh, because he was everything. He was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was uh, an architect, he was a brilliant poet, and uh, each one of these occupations could, could take a course of lectures. And as such, even the longest books on Michelangelo can only touch the surface. He, uh, as I said, he was, uh, he was about eight years older than Raphael, but he will live uh, close to 90 years and as such will create magnificent work throughout the, well not 90 years, but at least 70 over those years. Uh, one of his first commissions was a Pieta, or rather the Pieta, that was commissioned for a French cardinal who was a representative uh, in Rome. The sculpture is done in Carrara uh, marble and represents, this is still a 15th century work, it represents a perfect triangle still very much in the manner of Leonardo da Vinci of a Madonna with Christ uh, across her lap. It could be uh, called Pietà, it could be called uh, Lamentation, but uh, what we see here is not really so much as a grieving mother, as um, more of a, more of a monumental allegory of the church, as she presents uh, her son to the believers, and thus we see her. Her face is is very very young, and there was a controversy about that. Uh, but uh, Michelangelo, who, as I said, was a poet himself, also loved Dante, presumably uh, quoted uh, a line from Dante, virgin mother, daughter of thy son, and thus explained the youth on the, of, the, of the Madonna's face. He uh, 
Christ is, um, except for the loin cloth, is otherwise nude, and, and his nudity is juxtaposed against this very, very rich garment of the Madonna, thus conveying all the more significantly both the nudity and, uh, and the virtuosity of uh, carving the drapery. Uh, this is one of the rare times when Michelangelo actually signed his name and it is signed right here on, uh, on the ribbon that runs across the garment of the Madonna. And here they have both faces. Madonna, the Madonna is calm and Christ's face has, uh, the eyes are closed, the uh, lips are just slightly open and uh, the hint of a beard uh, is chiseled brilliantly into the marble. His next commission is, um, is his David for the Florentine Republic. <sighs> to say uh, of Michelangelo that he was titanic, uh, that he was uh, the greatest, I mean these are all uh, this is all common phraseology that, that still doesn't really describe the man. But uh, the same can be applied to the, uh, the figure of David, which uh, the Florentines uh, began to call the giant. The Florentine Republic was the smallest of the important republics of Italy. Milan, Milan Venice, uh, uh, Naples, the papacy, and then Florence was the smallest. And yet Florence was obliged to fight against all of them. And Florence came to look at David as the uh, allegory of herself uh, fighting against giants. And that is how Michelangelo is in fact representing, uh, representing him. He, um, he also, he looks, um, he has uh, fortitude, uh, vigor, also anger as he is staring toward a distant hill from beyond which presumably Goliath is about to appear. Unlike uh, Donatello, unlike Verrocchio before him, he does not show Goliath's uh, head at the same time. This is the moment of, of anxious waiting. This is a moment of preparedness and thus stands this extraordinary figure with, um, with a stone in his right hand and a sling uh, behind him that he is not even preparing yet. He is waiting for the apparition. He perhaps even to hear, you can almost, you can almost see him listening to the approaching, for the approaching steps. The face is very tense and very expecting. Now, if you notice, uh, the head may appear to be slightly large in proportion to the rest of the body, as is his hand. And the reason for that was that um, he was meant to, to be one of the Akrotera sculptures on top of the cathedral, right here. This is an installation, or here, again, this is an example. So, as you see there, he is, I know it's very difficult to see, and it would be difficult to see as well from the bottom up. But as a result, Michelangelo created a head bigger, so with the foreshortening looking up, it would in fact look very normal, and the same with the hand. But when the um, Florentines saw this image, they, um, they just couldn't reconcile to uh, placing him on top of the cathedral and placed him right in front of uh, their Palazzo Vecchio. The, uh, yes, he was uh, meant to be, look at, to be looked at from bottom up. Here is the face, and as you see the face, his brows, his forehead are creased, his eyes are very, very intent, and uh, his face looks away from the uh, direction of the body, thus engaging the space beyond. You can see uh, the virtuosity of carving with all the veins and arteries in full view. And here he is from the back with a sling 
across the back. The next, um, his next task was uh, Julius II's tomb. And Julius II uh, felt himself to be the greatest of popes, and as a result, he wished to have the greatest of tombs. And Michelangelo made uh, an approximate sketch of it, which met, of course, with the uh, approval of the Pope, and there would be uh, at least two dozen, probably more, life-size or over life-size statues that uh, only a titan could imagine he could do in his lifetime. And uh, this is uh, the approximate uh, scheme of the monument, which will never come to fruition, because soon enough, uh, Julius II will change his mind and uh, will ask Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of a Sistine Chapel instead. Here is uh, Julius II. He is standing in front of his own uh, uncle, who was Sixtus IV, the one who commissioned Florentine artists to paint the sides of the Sistine Chapel back in the 15th century. And here's Julius as a young cardinal. There he is. Here's the Pope. And this particular fresco was done by Melozza da Forli, who also belonged to 15th century narrative group of painters. Uh, Sistine Chapel was was built as, uh, as a fortress because the uh, Roman crowds were often unruly and uh, so the chapel was built as an escape for the Pope and his retinue in case of uprisings. And inside here, as you see, these are the uh, frescoes that were done by 15th century Florentine and Umbrian and North Italian painters. At this time, the ceiling of the chapel was just uh, blue with the stars painted on it, as was often the case. Here it was, and here's what it became. Michelangelo will spend four years uh, doing the ceiling, uh, between 1508 and uh, 1512. And by all accounts, it appears that Julius allowed him to devise the religious scheme, which was extraordinary because painters were not theologians, and, uh, and usually it was the theologians who devised the scheme and then asked painters to paint it. But this doesn't seem to be the case here. And it seems that Michelangelo looked at the chapel and he saw life of uh, Christ on one side and life of Moses on the other side and felt that um, these are the two extremely important themes, biblical themes, and best he could do is to paint creation that came before the flood. And that's what he will do. Um, after he, uh, he paints his creation of the world, 25 years later, about 25, he will paint the end of the world. And that's what we see on the west wall. And that's what we look at in the in our in our next lecture. He will divide the central part of the ceiling into into nine rectangles, four larger and four smaller, and then those he will divide into three parts, three of each. The first three parts would be uh, he would depict the story of Noah, the, uh, the flood, uh, the uh, making of the sacrifice for safe delivery, and uh, Noah drunk and disgraced. The central portion would be uh, the creation of Adam, Eve, and then the original sin. And then the last uh, three parts he would dedicate to uh, the original creation of God, first dividing light from dark, then God creating the sun and the moon, and then uh, the planets. This is how Michelangelo went painting the ceiling. But as you see, he did it anachronistically, because in fact, of course, the first three, God's creation, come first, then the creation of uh, man and woman, and then the story of Noah. However, uh, 
Michelangelo felt very much that he was not adept at the art of fresco painting. He did spend a couple of years under Ghirlandaio when he was a child in Florence, but after that preferred sculpture. So he felt that starting with Neuer was um, less alarming than starting with God himself. And as such, he began with Neuer. Uh, we'll look through the most important of these um, frescoes. Here, when you get the, your PowerPoint, you'll be able to, to follow the uh, progression. And here is the ceiling. Then on the sides of the ceiling, he will paint uh, Jewish prophets and classical sibyls. Uh, here are the first three. He chose the largest one to paint the flood itself. Then uh, he uh, paints on the smaller one the sacrifice. Uh, and then on another smaller one the drunkenness of Noah. After he painted these three, it seems that <laughs> he uh, climbed down, looked up, and realized that there are way too many figures. The, uh, the height is too great, and one cannot see them very well. And therefore, the next three, he dramatically reduces the amount of people in his representations and, uh, and increases the size. And thus we have uh, one, uh, a large rectangle that he divides into two, the original sin and expulsion from uh, paradise, then the creation of Eve, and then the creation of Adam. Again, anachronistic, because obviously the creation of Adam comes first, then Eve, then the original sin. Here we have the original sin and the expulsion from paradise and uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, and what is fascinating about this is that he gives Adam his own agency. He does not make Eve guilty of seducing the man as the Christian church will later maintain. Adam very much reaches for his own apple. Uh, meanwhile, Eve looks very uh, muscular, and that is because Michelangelo mostly used male bodies in order to paint female. Uh, also, of course, an interesting point here is uh, by positioning Eve's head where Michelangelo did position it, uh, it appears that Michelangelo's idea of uh, the forbidden fruit was not an apple. And uh, the expulsion from paradise, he essentially uh, uh, borrowed Masaccio's scheme, Masaccio's composition, and changed it slightly. In his case, here's Adam and Eve. Uh, the angel is similar, except he is now foreshortened, and uh, for the sake of balance, he uh, gave the angel his sword into his left hand so that the balance is maintained between the angel, the left-handed angel with his sword and the tree with, um, with the branch uh, going into the other direction. The tree in this case is an oak because uh, uh, Julius II came from Del Rovere family and Del Ro and Rovere means oak and therefore all around the Sistine Chapel you will see oak leaves and acorns. Another one, of course, is uh, creation of Adam and uh, with all the spectacular male nudes that Michelangelo created, the one of David and the one of uh, Adam, of course, stand out. And um, do they convey exalted sexuality? Without question. Of course they do. Uh, here is this uh, the great uh, muscled uh, body of uh, Adam, redolent with um, with languor and almost with uh, unwillingness really to to spring to life. Uh, it seems he has uh, a foreknowledge that life will not be easy 
and as such would rather be left alone. Uh, he is uh, presented in a concave form, whereas God, with his uh, court, are presented in a very convex form. Thus, one rushes, one full of energy rushes towards the other, full of languor. And God, in this case, uh, Michelangelo can paint fresco by now, like God himself. And God is also very muscular and, uh, as I said, full of energy. And it seems that all this energy is concentrated in his index finger, which is about to touch the index finger of Adam. The palpitation of this tremendousness is... Um, we can see it, we can feel it. Uh, and here you can compare, this is Ghiberti, where we began, God creating Adam on his doors, which, um, which was brilliant, remarkable for the time Ghiberti created them. But then when um, we jump almost a hundred years ahead, we see something titanic, something unbelievable. Uh, and then the last uh, threesome, is God separating uh, light from darkness, God creating uh, sun and moon, and God creating planets. And as I said, even though chronologically this is to be the first fresco in the series because this is where God separates light from dark. It is the last one in Michelangelo's effort. By now, again, he paints uh, fresco like God. He, uh, he practically doesn't even use cartoons any longer. And he also knows how to paint De Soto in Su. Not only f regular foreshortening, but also foreshortening from bottom up. And here we see God's neck and his nostrils. This tremendous figure uh, of strength and energy s beginning to create the world as we know it. And thus we have it here. Well, uh, Michelangelo will never be happy about, uh, about Julius cancelling his uh, commission for the tomb. He will uh, create some of the sculptures, some of the sculptures do exist, and uh, one of them is a dying slave in the, in the Louvre, uh, where, again, he represents a beautiful, languid figure that is standing up while technically it should be lying down. The uh, attitude of uh, the figure itself is that of a reclining attitude. On the other hand, there is a rebellious slave, the one that is tied up and trying to free himself with every muscle, uh, Di directed to that uh, task, and here they are, both of them are in the Louvre. Uh, this is the monument of Julius II, as we know, as we know it today. It, um, it lives in, um, in the church of St. Peter in, in Winkley, St. Peter in Chains, and the one sculpture here that was meant for the original uh, monument is that of Moses. Uh, here is San Pietro in Vincoli, and here too he is represented with this remarkable physique of a deity. He is um, half sitting, half wishing to get up. His uh, face expresses great anger, great displeasure. He has his two tablets uh, with him. Uh, he, uh, his beard is uh, an avalanche and uh, his, uh, his legs are extremely powerful which, and they, so they should be. He had just gone up and down the Mount Sinai twice, so no wonder he is so buff. And uh, his head is turned presumably towards uh, uh, the culprits who uh, who now worship the golden calf as uh, while he was uh, he was away. Uh, here is again the hand where every artery and every vein can be seen, and the uh, the face. If we saw tension in the face of David, this this face exhibits all the wrath. And 
This is, uh, we, we have just looked at, uh, well, we looked at Raphael, of course, and we looked at Michelangelo uh, in his uh, early creation, and already then he had achieved what no one else could possibly achieve. He, um, he created a race of, uh, of titans, really, and these titans became the material symbols of a moral force. Uh, and uh, with this, he will continue uh, until the age of 90. He will have uh, a great span of time to create more of this titanic miracle. Thank you very much, and I will see you next week.